Reading the Book of Creation The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. It was a dark and stormy night. That was the opening line of every book Snoopy ever started to write in the Peanuts comic strip. There's something about opening lines. You know, for example, when you hear the phrase once upon a time that you're about to hear a story. Opening lines set the stage. They introduce the plot and the characters. They set everything in motion. And in the case of Once Upon a Time, you know the kind of story you're about to hear. A fantasy with fantastical beats, but real human personalities. In this message, we're going to set this story in motion and look at the story of creation, the story in Genesis over a couple of sessions. Before we go any further, just like Sesame Street, let's note some influences. Today's message is brought to you by the preacher Chuck Sackett, scholars Tom Wright, Henri Blochet, John Walton, Eugene Peterson, and a friend of mine, Brett Inder. I stand on the shoulders of giants. You can't understand God's story without starting in Genesis 1. The story is this. It starts out in the Garden of Eden. It is a story then of human rebellion, a rescue plan ultimately leading to Jesus and the church, and eventually in Revelation, God returns and restores our garden world. If the Bible is a symphony, Genesis 1-2 to is the overture with some of the main themes of the whole music within that overture. When we look at chapter 1 of the creation story, we find ourselves with what one man calls the prelude and the plot. It is musical and poetic and it sets up the story. Chapter 2 sets the characters in motion and gives us the plot of the story. The underpinning assumption is that the story begins with an act of God. In the beginning, God. Generations later, when the author of Hebrews was writing to a group of Jewish Christians, he explained, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We must decide whether we want to accept by faith the opening line of the Bible. If you accept the statement, in the beginning God, then that underlies everything. And everything else in scripture is highlighted and sits under that assumption. Note that the phrase doesn't answer the question how, but does answer the question who, God Genesis 1 verses 1 to 2 sets the stage for everything else that's going to happen. And it gives us the words beginning, spirit and water. Those feature uh, strongly later in biblical uh, theology. Firstly, I want to say this. Creation establishes a sense of time. Genesis 1 verse 2 tells us that the earth was formless and empty. The first three days of creation are a direct address to the issue of formlessness. Days four, five and six address the other issue, the emptiness and lack of substance. The rest of chapter one is written with the repetition and rhythm of Hebrew poetry. And in the first account, you get the sense that you're viewing creation from heaven's perspective. There is cadence and music a count and a tempo, and the poet captures your ear and the eye of your heart, and he begins to help you understand that there's going to be shape and substance to this formless void. In Hebrew, this has words that almost rhyme with one another, and the pattern of language has a repeated kind of rhythm. It could almost be chanted or even perhaps rapped. In chapter 2, when the narrator talks about the seventh day, he does something unusual with the cadence and tempo. Instead of waiting until the end of the day to number it, he announces the day on the front end. Not only does he name the day first, he says it's the seventh day, but he names it 
three times. This is poetry and music and rhythm. It's designed for the ear and the heart with that emphasis on the seventh day. And it's actually very difficult for translators to do a good job of the Hebrew here. This opening account has such intricate repetition. God is mentioned by name more than 30 times. And God said, and God said, and God said. God is the subject of all the verbs. God created, God made, God saw, God named, God blessed. And the text is punctuated with parenthesis and God said, and there was evening, and there was morning. And God said, and it was so. Six times he says, it was good. The poet wants us to feel this text in such a way that we understand there is music to creation that's intended to help place us within time. Thus, the first emphasis of Genesis 1, according to Eugene Peterson, is about the way we measure life. We are restricted as human beings to measuring life in one fundamental way, time. When Paul speaks to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, he explains that the Creator God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Time is how we measure life, and it's the way we respond to God. So my point here is there is a rhythm at the heart of things. Work, play, rest, worship. Ecclesiastes 3 picks up on this. There is a time for everything. So firstly, how is the rhythm of your life? Is it out of whack? Is it being corrected? Is it finding a good balance? Is it acknowledging God in all things and being aware to be thankful in all things? How is the balance in your life? How is the rhythm? establishes a sense of God's presence. This seventh day is important, which is why it's emphasized. In the ancient Near East, temples were dedicated in a ceremony ending on the seventh day. In Genesis 1, the whole world is Yahweh's temple. At the end of the week, there is a sense of completion. The earth is God's home. God is in the house and all is right with the world. Heaven is firstly not a remote place way up there and far away. This world is God's abode. This world is meant to be God's temple. As Paul later picks up on in Acts when he notices the shrine to the unknown God, he then declares that this God they did not know about has come close in Jesus and is the one true God. This is the message of Genesis 1. God is close, not distant not an absentee landlord who's wound up the world and left it to get on with itself and left it to its own devices. He's not removed himself from involvement in his creation. And so the psalmist can say, how can I hide from his presence? Not even in exile or the ends of the earth. If this text in Genesis was finally written down during the exile, the Israelites who had lost their earthly temple to the Babylonian destruction would know what this meant. God is all over the world, even in Babylon. They can find him wherever they are. His temple is everywhere. And this counteracts the cultural narrative of the time that said, if you were a defeated people and your temple was destroyed, your God was destroyed too. Instead, the fact that God creates all things says that this true God who has revealed himself to Israel is still in charge. He is still involved. 
And in fact, those pagan gods may even be alluded to in what's created on the various days in Genesis chapter 1, the kind of gods of light and stars and so on and so forth. That is not to say these gods were real, but that the Lord is above all things in heaven and earth and under the earth, whether real or imagined, whether supposedly powerful or not. But God is not above in a modern sense of the word, out there remotely somewhere, but involved in his own world and in charge. He's not hiding, he's sovereign. He's not hiding, it's we who cover our eyes. It's we who say God is camouflage. We just need to know how to look. Just because you can't be seen doesn't mean you're not doing your job. Even as we speak, the same one who created is also sustaining. Whatever method he uses, whether evolution or whatever, he is still the one who got the ball rolling and sustains all things. And we ought to develop eyes to see this. Psalm 121. According to Eugene Peterson, Peterson it, it, it rejects a worship of nature. It rejects a worship or a religion of stars and flowers, a religion that makes the best of what it finds on the hills. Instead, it looks to the Lord who made heaven and earth. Help comes from the creator, not from creation. The creator is always awake. He will never doze or sleep. Baal took long naps and one of the jobs of the priest was to wake him up when someone needed his attention and they were not always successful. The Creator is Lord over time. He guards you when you leave and when you return, your beginnings and your endings. He is with you when you set out on your way. He is still with you when you arrive at your destination. You don't need to, in the meantime, get supplementary help from the sun or the moon. The Creator is Lord over all natural and supernatural forces. He made them. Sun, moon, rocks have no spiritual power. They are not able to inflict evil upon us. And we need not fear any supernatural assault from any of them. God guards you from every evil. Creation also establishes a sense of space. Genesis 1 inspires awe and wonder. And then in chapter 2, God seems to say, I want to show you this again, but this time I want you to see this from the earth's perspective. Genesis 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then in chapter 2 verse 4, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Do you notice the shift there? Heaven and earth becomes earth and heaven. Chapter 1 sets the stage. Chapter 2 begins the story as we experience it. And there's an incredible shift related also to the, the name of God in the second account of creation. Chapter 1 records 30 occurrences of the word Elohim, a name for God, and it's a kind of generic term for God. In chapter 2, God is called the Lord God. That's the word Yahweh or Jehovah in some Bibles. This name for God isn't even introduced to us until the book of Exodus, but there it is, the beginning of the story of creation. As Moses is preparing to lead the people out of Egypt, God says to him, tell the people, I am, Iye Yahweh, I am who I am. I am the one who sends you. I am the sending God. The Hebrews wouldn't pronounce the, the word Yahweh. Instead, they substituted the word Adonai because they were so uh, protective, as it were, and, and um, careful not to tread on holy things. And so in our English translations, we, have, we find the word Lord in capital letters. But here in Genesis chapter 2, the name the Lord God is used instead of Elohim. And this is a covenant name, a relational name that was revealed to Moses. With this shift, God and humans begin a journey together. Chapter 2 divides naturally into two pieces, verses 
uh, 4 through 14 uh, recount the creation and placement of humans and verses 15 through 25 are about relationships between people. If chapter 1 is about time, chapter 2 is about place as location takes on great importance. And in, in 2 verse 8 and 2 verse 15, the narrator tells us God put or placed the humans in the garden. And the garden is named, it's the Garden of Eden. It's given boundaries, four rivers. So there is identification, boundaries and location. And these things emphasize the fact that we are put someplace. The word ground from which the, the man was formed is the Hebrew word Adama. The man Adam came from the ground, Adama. Five different times the, the narrator talks about ground. In fact, the man is mentioned 18, Adama, and the soil from which he came 19 times. It's as if the poet is trying to help us understand that we are made of the same stuff as the world in which we live. We don't live in some ethereal world looking to float on clouds someday, somewhere. We live in this world, the one that God has made. And that's part of the challenge of understanding the nature of this text and its implication for us. Wherever here is, wherever you are, you are supposed to be. There's a TV show alone that I like to watch. My wife and I have been watching it a lot recently doing that binge watching which you do when you're in lockdown. And it puts a bunch of survivalists alone in the wilderness with nothing but their wits and a few tools to see how they fare. Each of them are allotted a space, a piece of ground, an area, and are expected to um, not roam about too much, more than a few miles. They're expected to make ends meet. They're expected to make a camp, find food, create a fire, shelter, etc, etc, and survive for as long as possible. And their job is not to whinge about where they are, but to get on with it. And those who have the best psychological health, who learn to be grateful, who learn to go with the rhythm of the land and learn to notice the good things that they've got, also are those who tend to survive the longest. You ever notice how place becomes so important, how we want to identify and be identified by our place? And I say this as someone who was born in England, grew up in Scotland, and I'm now an Aussie. Gregory of Nyssa was appointed by his brother in the early years of the church to be a bishop, to go to a little town called Nyssa in central Turkey. Gregory didn't want to go. It was too small a place for his ambitions. But he went and in the process he learned contentment. Most of us might not have heard of Gregory if we come from a Protestant background, but he was famous in church history for helping the church come to terms with a tiny little issue called the Trinity. And his writings helped shape our understanding of the triune nature of God. He's also one of the, of the writers most responsible for helping us understand the infinite nature of God and what it means to be finite as humans. And this younger brother of a bishop appointed to this fairly empty space on the road found his place where God put him. And there he blossomed into one of the greatest theologians of the church. He understood that we are where God wants us to be. We don't have another place. If you're always looking for another place, then you will never be of any value where you are. I have to say this to myself often, Jules, cease being so restless for the next thing, for what's around the corner. Years ago, when I was considering a job offer, some words from the psalmist struck home to me that caused me to refuse the offer. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Sometimes we ought to be content and not constantly looking for the next thing. So be careful that your sense of guidance isn't just you adopting the spirit of, of the age that wants the next thing. God gives a huge array of choices and a large field to live our lives in. So do be adventurous and bold, but don't cross a line into restlessness and a lack of contentment. So what have we said today? 
Firstly, get into the rhythm of life. Make sure your life is not out of step with the rhythm of creation and with the rhythm, or in the words of Eugene Peterson, the rhythms of grace. Secondly, notice God's presence. Learn to notice him. Sensitize yourself to the God who is in all the world and from whom we cannot hide, who is the Lord wherever we are in darkness or in good times, whose presence is near, who is closer than hands and feet, who is closer than our own breathing. This is the Lord, the revealed covenant God of the Bible. And thirdly, space. Wherever you are, rejoice, be thankful before expecting the next big thing. Next time we're going to reflect some more on these wonderful words in Genesis. My name's Jules. Thanks for listening.